Welcome to Mysterious Universe, Season 31, Episode 14. Coming up on this show, we've got dream, pre-crime, psychic bird-dogging, and how the Giza pyramids are cheap forgeries. I'm your host, Benjamin Grundy. Joining me is Aaron Wright. I thought we already established that in the last plus episode. No, no, we established that someone came in and stole all the copper wiring out of them. That's right. <laughs> we hadn't alleged that they were fake and gay quite yet on that episode. Right. But we were but heading in that direction. And you're going to do that today? Yes. Okay, perfect. How are they fake? They're just fake. What do you mean they're fake? They're, People can see them. They walk up them. They're not what they claim to be. They're oh. like a cheap Chinese knockoff. Like you scratch away at them and it's just cheap plaster. <laughs> <laughs> It's like Despicable Me, they're just inflatable. No, I wanted to look at Natron Theory. We were discussing this at the end of the last Plus episode. There's this really interesting guy on Twitter. His name's Marcel Foti, Hungarian guy. He's on the screen there at the moment. His handle is at Fomahun. But he's been breaking down this thing called Natron Theory, Mm -hmm. which goes into the idea that ancient people didn't move these giant blocks to create ancient megaliths like the Pyramid, right, stone, because Stonehenge. That's the ridiculous modern archaeological narrative is that, you know, thousands of slaves, you know, pulled these enormous blocks from reed rafts mm. in the Nile and then dragged it across the, you know, the sand floor and then dropped it there. No. Like, here's an example. Here's a tweet from Jimmy Corsetti talking about these megaliths of Japan. And he asked the question, why did they choose to lift and stack 40 plus ton polygonal stones instead of leaving the heaviest ones at the bottom. So you've got these small ones at the bottom and on top, just these gigantic yeah, stones. Larger. Yeah. I mean, it really defies logic. Well, it's like the equivalent. So you've got these little stones down the bottom, like it's the equivalent of 10 or 12 stones. Yeah. And again, 40 plus tons. And I love that Marcel quote tweets this and he's just like, because they didn't, they didn't place 40 plus ton stones on top of those smaller ones because they're not stones. So, but what are they? Surely modern you know, geochemical analysis would reveal that they are stone. No, it reveals that they're not. So and this is, even, this is even the case with the, the Giza pyramids as well. They, you could get a geologist to examine the stones using all the modern techniques, but unless they used a particular type of very modern... I can't remember whether it's microscopy, not microscopy, but just some very modern X-ray technique. Yeah, like, uh, no, it could be. It could be like electron microscopy you can use to analyze that and, you know, scanning microscopy. So, yeah, all those sort of techniques. Yeah, to to most geologists who don't use these particular expertise that have been developed by material scientists, it just appears as normal stone, but it is not normal stone. That's what we've got coming up. And that's what uh, Marcel has been breaking down with his natron theory. Okay. All right. I'm looking forward to getting into that a little bit later in the show. But uh, for this episode, uh, actually funny that you should bring up you know, a previous episode because only last week you were looking into the concept of psychic detectives and how people that have psychic abilities are... Yeah, she's dead, honey. <laughs> she's dead, honey. That actually... That is coming up in today's episode. That is, and I'm using that that line quite a lot because I ended up picking up a re-released issue of Psychic Detectives using the power of the mind to solve true crimes. If we could put that just in there, uh, this is a re-release. It was only released back in uh, 2020 or 2021 of a 2001 classic by Jenny Randalls and Peter Ho. And of course, we know that they've both, you know, independently done great research. Jenny, they've done great research together. Uh, of course, they've looked into things like, um, you know, mysterious lights and fires and, of course, Jenny Randall's with her time storms. But I decided to go into this because I thought, okay, let's let's dig a little bit deeper into these concepts of, of psychic detectives and how, um, you know, people's intuitions can allow them to solve crimes. And perhaps surprisingly, while that is covered in this book, that's not really what it fully encompasses. Okay. It goes into a whole range of things like spirits helping to solve their own murders, people being possessed, uh, you know, basically government cover-ups being revealed by seances, like all this kind of stuff, which is kind of at the upper limits of psi phenomena. Yeah, it was fun covering that on the Plus episode a few weeks back. I can't remember the name of the authors, but we were covering a book where it was three uh, former police officers, former guys in law enforcement, who were writing a manual on how police departments and um, you know other law enforcement agencies yep. could use psychics in their investigations and how to vet them, how to train them, 
Uh, and it was very kind of dry, but it had great anecdotes in it. My favorite one was the guy who sat in the back of the police car, had his left hand on a bag of weed and his right hand on the window of the patrol car, and they would just drive around, and he could just sense which houses <laughs> had it's marijuana. It's so in it. surreal. <laughs> and he would it's... like, bing, that's a house. Yeah. And the, the house that he binged for the officers he was with, they looked at each other and they said, that's actually the most well-known drug dealer in the town. That's where he lives. Well, I mean, perhaps to someone who's been in this field for a while, you may not be surprised to learn that a lot of the really heavy uh, psychic stuff that you know solves crimes and comes up with resolutions and gives new clues all relates to touch and psychometry. Oh, really? Where you're actually touching something that seems to have a really heavy influence here, but not just psychometry. The other thing is dousing. Yeah, right. Dousing place. So it's like people picking up on waves or energies or form. Mm. And some of the descriptions are just truly incredible. Well, remember the Polish guy I spoke about about a year ago? And one of his techniques was to wear the clothes of the missing person. Yes. And yep. there was a famous case where the the I think it was a woman went missing near a lake or something. And they recovered her shirt, which was dirty and bloodied. And he ended up putting it on and it's just an excuse for that guy to get into drag. That's Parading all around is. his apartment wearing this <laughs> woman's top. But, well, you know what, though? That that happens more often than we realize. There are a number of cases where it it really is that someone goes missing. And funnily enough, I don't know if it's because um, when they recover a piece of clothing, clothing is often used by psychometrists and uh, policing agencies. And a lot of the time, it's all on the down low. But yes, you know, yeah. back, back in the 60s and the 70s, there was some element of recognition of policing agencies utilizing these people. Um, but for some reason... It seems like in the 70s and the 80s, that changed, and it wasn't so much because of the ridicule factor. Of course, that's there, and there have been plenty of times where uh, policing agencies are actually convinced that the person has that knowledge because they're directly involved in the case, and they're either returning to the scene or getting some kick out of you know messing with them. But it came about because um, the people that were involved, the psychic investigators, were under threat when they were revealing clues. All right. So from and there's an, I'll get into it later on and as we get towards the end of the show. But there was you know one group of occult murderers that were hanging around California, and for whatever reason, when this psychic detective, psychic investigator was able to hone in on whatever was going on with this group, it's like it opened a connection between the two of them, and she ended up being absolutely terrified because hmm. these these this group, this occult group, started hunting her down and harassing her. And doing truly terrible things. Interesting. So let, let's jump into it and we'll start off early on because this stuff, you know, as much as we've been talking recently about the 60s and the, the 70s, and yes, that, what was it? It was the previous oh, book. I just had, I flashed up the book. I was psychic covering. Criminology, a guide for using psychics yeah. in investigations. And here's the new one, Psychic Detectives. So this has been re-released. Oh, re-released. 2021. Yeah, okay. 2021, this was re-released, but uh, an original came out, or the original came out in 2001. Uh, but it's been updated, which is really, really good. There's just little details in there that... Uh, just kind of give you some hints and clues as to there's definitely something going on here. Like I know that there's so much skepticism and people go, oh, that's garbage and that can't happen. But there's just so many cases. And the fact that policing agencies, even today, still bring these people in and try to get an edge and get a clue means that there is something about the human condition, this natural psychic ability that we have, which is providing mm -hmm. clues and answers. So some of the earliest though, reports come from uh, 1631. This is from September of 1631, where it relates to a Christopher Walker. Uh, and this is in uh, Chester in the UK. And essentially Christopher had um, taken control of this farm. And uh, for whatever reason, I think family members had passed away rough times back then. And his niece came to live with him. He needed to produce 10,000 bushels for his lord. Pretty much. Come midsummer or death. Well, his wife died, right? Oh. So his, his wife died and then his niece came to live with him. But his niece happened to be his niece-in-law. So rumours started going around town that it's like, well, you know. <laughs> mm. And of course, even back then, the, the ridicule factor was just, I mean, it happens today, but, you know, no one really bats an eyelid if there's stuff like that. But back then it was a scandal amongst the village and everyone knew everyone. And this was a scandal. This was reality TV for everyone before TVs existed. And so because of this, um, essentially, he had, uh, this is Christopher, had sent her away. Like he'd sent her away and said, oh, no, 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 no. You know, I've, I've sent her away. There's just absolutely nothing going on between us whatsoever. Where'd he send her? Well, that will become apparent in a moment. Apparently he sent her to, to Lincolnshire or somewhere like that just so that she could, you know, um, essentially just get out of the spotlight and the limelight. But it just so happens that there was a, uh, a woman, uh, a local 
actually, um, I'm sorry, it was a local miller, I'm sorry, I'll come back to the woman in a second. There was a local miller by the name of James Graham. And James Graham, one night, there was a storm that was going on outside and uh, he could hear that someone was rattling downstairs in his larder or wherever it was. And so he wanders downstairs, ready to fight this brigand or intruder or whoever it was, this thief that was coming into his house. And uh, he pulls back the door. And as he pulls back the door, there's this disheveled girl standing there. And she's clearly cold and she's got, you know, like um, black or dark marks over her, like mud or something else, something similar, coal dust. No one's really sure. And he realizes that it's just some poor young girl down in her luck that, that needs assistance. So he says to her, he's like, oh, please come in, you know, how, how can I help you? And she immediately unloads that uh, she's a spirit and she's been murdered <laughs> and she needs him to avenge her death. And his response is like, oh, and he says, not my problem, lady. Well, yeah. <laughs> no, it, it's, it's funny because again, 1631. He said there was some knowing about like looking into the eyes. It was like he could just pick up that there was, he was talking to a spirit, even though it was a full materialized form, a proper physical form. And so he gets details as to, to what had happened. And after she tells him this story, essentially Anne describes that uh, Christopher had knocked her up. And so knowing that, that she was going to start showing, he sent her away. That's why he sent her away. But when he sent her away, he employed a miner by the name of Mark Sharp. And so he got this miner and he said to the miner, you have to take her away to Lincolnshire and you know, keep her away until, she's, um, until she has the child. Uh, then what? Well, that's what he told Anne was what going to happen to Anne. But Anne found out later on that Mark actually was uh, told to kill her. Yeah, that's... Yeah. And he did. He did, yeah. Read between and he, the lines there. He, absolutely. He used mining tools. He killed her. And funnily enough, he threw her into like a coal stack, uh, which is, explains like the weird, mm. you know, dust and coal dust that she had over her body. Um, but this poor Miller, you know, who doesn't want to get involved in anything like this? And yeah, what's it got to do with him? I know. Uh, this, and we never find out. We never find out why she went to him. Um, He's the town's psychic detective. Well, this is the thing, right? <laughs> what I realize, and this is not said in the book, but I get this impression in so many of these stories that it's almost like... Uh, the spirit or the energy or whatever it is, it seeks out the closest person who is sensitive yeah, to it. it's just looking for someone that can listen. Exactly. Yeah, just someone who can pick up on it. It doesn't have to be a family member, although, you know, that ties in more with crisis apparitions and those sorts of events. Uh, and those do pop up, but it's more likely it's just someone who is sensitive to this kind of stuff. Um, but of course, you know, this is absurd. Like, no one's going to believe him. The local magistrate is not going to believe him. And so he says to her, I'm sorry, I, I, I can't help you. Now she disappears. Uh, she returns two nights after, but this time invades his dreams. She actually gets into his dreams and warns him that she will not leave him alone until he reports this, until he does something. So he does. He finally goes, well, you're going to think I'm, go I'm going crazy, so I'm going to do it. So he approaches a local magistrate. This is a magistrate by the name of Thomas Little. Um, and of course, they start investigating. They get hold of Mark Sharp, the miner. They get hold of uh, Christopher Walker, and they start um, investigating. And of course, they ask all these questions, and they really can't get anything, right? They can't get much out of them until, of course, they somehow, through this, this information that had come through from the spirit, were able to work out where this coal stack was or where her body was. And indeed, they found her body. And this freaked out um, uh, the, both of the accused. And apparently, this is the other element that becomes really strange, is that while the trial was taking place, someone who was sitting in the foyer who was, or back in the audience, who was, was watching this court case unfold claims that they could see her, like her spirit, come into the room as well. Mm. And now no one else saw it, but they saw it. So is that a story? How do we know about up? this well, case? How was it recorded? I don't know exactly how it was recorded. It's gone into the annals of history, though, uh, mm. because it's been uh, investigated. Um, but I'm not exactly sure how we, we know these details. It's just like an old story because it's so far back. I mean, 1631. Mm. Um, but allegedly, it's the first, one of the very first recorded incidents of this kind of thing taking place. And we did find out that... Uh, both the men were tried in Durham. They were both convicted, and I believe they were hanged. So, good riddance. Yeah, I mean, it's a, this is a case of essentially a, a ghost uh, solving its own murder. And in fact, though, if you start looking for these sorts of stories, you find numerous stories, even in, in more you know modern contexts, of people saying that um, you know if they've had a family member who was passed or who has been murdered, or a family member who disappears in suspicious circumstances. Well. You don't find many reports of people saying that they've actually seen the ghost of some people, although that does come up. Uh, they say that they appear in the dream mm. and they give information in the dream that comes through. And that information, though, is usually um, is accurate. But the problem with all of these stories or many of these stories is that the information is accurate once you've got some type of confirmation. 
So once something like the case is solved or once uh, a premonition takes place or an event occurs that you've had a premonition for, looking back with hindsight, you go, oh, of course, like, of course, that's amazing. But at the time when someone has a dream or they speak to a spirit or and they just give it this random information. Yeah, it's not helpful it's at the time. Useless. Yeah. Like it's completely useless and it makes it very difficult for investigators to be able to utilize it correctly. And that's why, uh, while many of these cases um, describe these sorts of events, it's only because we've got the hindsight to go, oh yeah, that makes absolute sense. So does uh, Jenny and who was the co-author? Uh, Peter Ho. Do they focus on mainly cases from the UK or is it all over? No, it's all over. Yeah, it's all. It's basically the UK and the US where many of these cases um, occur. But still in the UK, but let's skip forward to the 18th century. Uh, we have the story of Alan and uh, Clara, but this is what I call the Alan and Clara curse. And this relates to the Peak uh, District in, in Derbyshire. And uh, essentially it was 18th century England and Alan and Clara had uh, decided to elope. So they're going to head up into the, into the countryside to, to get married and to disappear because apparently uh, Clara's parents had refused him um, the right to marry and they, they, you know, being young and they weren't you know, happy with that. So they took off. But as they took off, they headed through this particular mining district, uh, again with the mining, but they headed through this mining district and as they were heading up into this mining district, for whatever reason, Clara had this terrifying nightmare absolutely terrifying nightmare, but it was vivid. It was realer than real. She saw uh, her partner being attacked, you know, Alan being attacked and murdered. She then saw herself being murdered. Like it was just a horrible, and she, she woke up screaming. She was that upset by this. Now, of course, when she woke up and she told Alan, Alan, of course, you know, it's like, well, that's ridiculous. You know, that's just a bad dream. Don't worry about it. Um, but regardless, they continued along on their journey and they came to this little, it was like a little outhouse or a, um, like a little restaurant or something like that along the way. And when they went in there, um, they started telling people that, you know, they'd fled from their family and what had happened. And they said where they were going, right? And it just so happened that a bunch of people overheard them. Now, these were young, well-to-do. Like, they would obviously come from from wealthy families in the way that they dressed, the way that they spoke. You know, it was quite, mm. class system was quite strong. So, they could tell that they weren't, you know, the normal kind of people uh, that they would have in that region. And so they continued, and unfortunately, they headed up into this pass between, it was a, a valley between two hills, and there was just no way that they could turn back. And Clara- and Brigands me, passed. Well, that's exactly what it was. Right. She she freaked <laughs> out because she was like, I've Rape seen this. valley. Pretty much. Mm. Yeah. She's like, I've seen this, and there was nothing, they couldn't go back, and what she Should we seen, take a shortcut through Rape Valley? Well, yeah. And what she saw, I mean, in her dream- happened in real life. It, it happened. She witnessed the entire thing um, and she was she was murdered. Now, it's like, well, okay, this story, like where did the information come from this story? Well, we found out later on that where the details came is that there appeared to be reports of a curse associated with this because there were five men that were involved in this, in this murder. But immediately after the murders took place, uh, two of the men, two who were miners, were also mining up on that hill. Mm. And mining is a dangerous profession, but they died in very suspicious circumstances. Like something like rocks fell and one of them fell. And, and then another two were involved in, uh, one was an accidental hanging and another one was uh, disappeared in strange circumstances. None of them knew Hillary Clinton, but it was just strange that yeah, five of them, weird. like five of them after involved in this, just all disappeared or died in mysterious circumstances. Suggesting like, previously where a, a spirit or an entity had come through to give information, uh, these spirits can still hang around and influence what's going on as well, you know, perhaps causing this, you know, um, you know, horrible event to take place. So then we move into what I call dream pre-crime, where we go into dream intrusions. And in fact, this one was reported by Colin Wilson, the great Colin Wilson, and it relates to a Maria Martin. So this happened on a farm in Sudsbury in England in 1827. It related to uh, a William Corder who inherited the property from his father. And uh, he was about to have a child out of wedlock, right? Which is a, a Victorian Uh-oh. no-no. Like it's a, it's a really, really Scandal. Bad. Yeah, exactly. It's it's not a good thing to do. Much like that earlier case, it's a very, very bad thing to do. And it will bring shame upon your family and you know all this kind of stuff. Um, but so what he did is be, no one really knew what was going on, apart from the fact that he had also sent uh, this woman away. Now, when he had sent her away, uh, it was Maria's, Maria's mother, uh, Anne Martin, was like, oh, so when's she coming back? Like, and he's like, oh yeah, yeah, she'll be back. She'll be back soon. Right. And she doesn't come back. She doesn't hear anything from her. Uh, I know it's 1827. So it's not instantaneous communication, but 
Uh, there's no telegrams. There's just there's just nothing. And then all of a sudden, she just happens to be reading, you know, a, a local publication where she sees that um, basically William Corder had put out a call for a wife. He's like, I need a wife. And she's like, what the hell is going on? How is it that you, you need a wife? Like, you've already got a wife. Like, what is happening? So um, she has a dream. She very soon has a dream and she insists that she's being visited by her daughter in her nightmares. And her daughter keeps on just yelling at her, red barn, red barn, red mm-hmm. barn. And she doesn't know what to make of it. Uh, she approaches the local authorities. That's the red barn. That's right. Screen. Yeah, yeah. So she approaches the local authorities. And uh, they don't necessarily believe her, but th- there's obviously something wrong because they go and ask William Corder. It's like, well, you know, you've sent your beloved away. Where is she? You know, what's, what's going on? Why are you looking for a new wife? Uh, eventually, they managed to get their way into this red barn where they found a sack. And inside the sack, sadly, was the body of Maria. Um, but it was under corn and had been hidden away. Now, there is no way that they would have been able to locate that unless the information had come through from someone who knew that it was that the body was there. So, of course, the you know in this case, it's come through the mother in the stream, and I highly doubt that the mother was you know involved in this this crime. Um, so it suggests that yes, there was some type of psychic knowing that came through. The Look at the today. physiognomy, though; he looks guilty already. <laughs> Look at him. I think that's just a bad drawing. Very I think we'll just, guilty. We'll just go with that. Uh, but then let's go jump into some more more modern reports. And we've got local man Chris Robinson of Bedfordshire in England. Uh, and in 1989, he realized that in his dreams and just in, in random manifestations, he was seeing crimes being committed in his local area. Like it was just was coming to him and he was seeing these crimes before they were taking place. So um, he described it as a mixture of pictures and odd symbols that he would be able to interpret uh, in his waking life, these symbols would come through. And the symbols were kind of strange, right? There's a really great example because after he had these experiences, he started offering local police um, just his interpretations of these clues to see if he could solve some crimes. And it just so happens that he did. He seemingly was able to provide information. They were able to validate that he had alibis and he wasn't connected with this stuff. He has a book, The Premonition Man, Chris Robinson. Oh, there you go. And it's about aliens. <laughs> Well, I'm surprised. <laughs> That's he the next into, segment. There you go. Yeah, he crossed into <laughs> aliens. But in um, this is really strange. In 1990, in May of 1990, after he'd become an official informant to local police agencies, he had this vivid dream, right? And in this dream, he said it was dogs that were running through a graveyard, which is, you know, that, that's a dream. We all have mm. weird kind of strange dreams. But he said not only were there dogs running through a graveyard, there were also cameras lying about everywhere and there were um, ticking clocks like these ticking clocks that were floating around, like a really kind of surreal dream. So he doesn't know what to make of this, but he knows that with these interpretations with the dream, it never actually means what you're seeing. It's like always a rep- representation of something else. So he got this feeling that it might have had something to do with the IRA, the terrorists. And he knew that it was connected to the RAF base at Stanmore. So he tried calling the RAF base and the RAF base, I think the kind of, I don't know if they took it that seriously. So he drove out there. He actually drove out there and insisted that there was going to be a bomb that was going to be planted and something was going to take place. And they recorded it. And this is what's really outstanding about this is that they recorded it. So we're able to know that this was a premonition of some kind. Yeah, right. But dogs running through, right? And there's no bomb. And they checked the perimeters and they checked Mm. around. There was just nothing. A month later, terrorists snuck into the base via a graveyard. What the hell? And blew up the photography <laughs> store, right? Right behind where um, one of the main base got a headquarters was. So it's like this dream he had about these dogs running through. The dogs were representations of the IRA. And they came through oh, a graveyard wow. that was at the back of the base. And those cameras was the photograph store that was blown up. And I don't, as, I don't mean as in a store. It was like where they stored film and camera equipment and everything mm-hmm. else on the base. That was what was blown up. So the problem with this, though, and this is what's pointed out, is that these premonitions only make sense usually after an event, but at the time are quite vague. And that's what I was saying at the start of the show there, is that it all makes sense now. It's like, oh, yeah, like terrorists. They snuck in through a graveyard. They blew up a photography shack. That that all makes sense. But when you're having this dream, how can you go, oh, there's dogs and ticking clocks in a graveyard? 
It's too archetypal to make any very archetypal you know, police action. Very Jungian, you know. It's it's just all open. To- That's why you need the pool with all the psychic ladies and the tubes going into them, connected to the computers, <laughs> and Tom Cruise going out there chasing people down. That photograph is actually in the book as well, and it kind of <laughs> it kind of is that. Um, well, he he reckons he predicted the seven seven tube suicide bombings. Did he really? Well, that's what this newspaper I w- says. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, there's only a couple of cases in here relating to him, but I, I really wouldn't be surprised with um, some of the experiences he, that he has. In fact, let me tell you one. So uh, British, you know, sensationalized television programs back in 1994, it's like a morning television show that heard about some of these stories mm. and some of what he was revealing and wanted to get him on the television so that they could, you know, run some tests with him. And, and they were trying to catch him out almost. Like it was kind of a bit of a, a gotcha moment. But what they said to him is they said, um, Look, we want you to come on the show, and when we when you come on the show, we're going to put an item in a box. It's going to be a household item. We'll tell you that. We'll put this household item in the box, and the following morning, you have to tell us what it is, and then we'll open the box on you know live television. Yeah, right. It's really, like, okay. Really exciting. Yeah, like, oh, like, wow! Can't wait to tune in for that. Yeah. Like, oh, but it's 1994, so you know they hadn't heard of Mysterious Jeez. Universe by then, so it's <laughs> it's fine, right? So, um, 1994, he goes on the television show, but he has a dream the night before. And in this dream, it's rather astonishing. He has this dream that um, he sees uh, a, a children's, like a, a sorry, no, it's, he says it's a children's toy. He doesn't say exactly what it is, but he says, look, when you open this box, it's going to be a children's toy. Mm. And he says this because the dream that he has, he says that he sees Christmas, uh, a postal sack, and um, just this impression that there's um, like something that's small, like a, like a kid's toy, obviously. So, yes, they open up, and yeah, it's a teddy bear, right? But what about these other factors, like these archetypes of seeing a postal bag and seeing a um, uh, a Christmas? Like, that doesn't kind of make sense. And I get it that he made the interpretation that it was a kid's toy mm. because of Christmas. It had nothing to do with it. What did he see right? then? Was it connected to something else? He saw the details of the guy that put the teddy bear in the box. He didn't know anything about the guy, so it was just a production assistant. Turns out this guy, his family ran a post office, and his birthday was Christmas Day. <laughs> nice. So it's like this, and this is a problem with this stuff. It's like it's, it's positive and negative at the same time. I shouldn't say it's it's a problem, but it's, it's a, a hazard when it comes up with this kind of stuff because he had a dream, mm. and that dream provided him with information which was accurate, but it wasn't precise. That reminds me of the story I covered on 2912 of Plus where the police officer was investigating or the detective was investigating a case of a missing boy and the psychic gave him very specific directions like follow the highway Mm -hmm. get to post 89 turn right you'll see a red house that's connected with the boy and the detective goes out there and he discovers that there was a red house there and there was this mud pit where years earlier this boy had uh gone off his motorcycle and drowned in the mud yeah and it had nothing, nothing to do to, with the person he was looking nothing for. Nothing like, at all. Really nothing at all. And that's why, I mean, this is why it's so vague. And um, it's like people can try to train themselves. And I think that's why we got to this point where there was investigators that were trying to create a handbook to help people hone their skill. Because it seems like it is this latent ability that a lot of people have. Um, but funnily enough, it seems like it's, it's women. Two thirds of people that have these abilities are women. Right, And it actually comes down to a report that was in the updated version of the book where I think it was the MRI imaging scanners had shown that, or whatever technique was being used, but had shown that women have significantly reduced spatial awareness, um, which explains all the car crash tweets I've been doing recently. <laughs> but, right? Did you it, say increased or decreased? No, they have decreased. I'm sorry. Decreased, they have decreased yeah. spatial awareness, yeah. right? But don't worry about it because they have significantly increased uh, psychic abilities because it seems like, because women have greater, uh, I think it's like, um, what was the visual processing areas? which is seemingly so associated with psychic phenomena. Mm. So at least you know you're going to hit something before you do. That's right. You can get out of the way. <laughs> so, but it's actually quite amazing. Amazing. Like, men, and women, men and women are different. Oh, I know. How shocking. How shocking is that? Um, but it's true. Like, it's been found that there's, like, for whatever reason, women seem to be able to more naturally pick up on these subtle vibrations. It's not saying you have to be a woman to be able to do this, but whatever reason, even though it's like there could be a familial connection that's going on, it seems like for whatever reason, the way that women's brains are structured allows them to pick up on this stuff more easily. Whereas for men, they need to hone it. It seems to be that kind of thing that's going on. Um, but then, of course, you know, you find that there are numbers of police officers that start, they say, look, they have a hunch. Like there was one story in here, which I didn't go into too great a detail, but it was a police officer who didn't view anything that he was experiencing as being being psychic, right? But the guy was considered to be this crack shot detective. 
But it came about because he said that he would like be reading over reports or he'd be looking over evidence. Like he said, he, if he would go back, he wouldn't just leave something. He would go back and read over and over again. And for whatever reason, like he'd be looking at a page and a word like would actually like jump out and up at him. Yeah. Like it would come out and he could see it and he would be able to go, oh, like, that means something. And he would follow that and that would lead to a clue. That was in the book I was covering is that most police departments will come into touch with psychic activity through one of their own department members because there's always an officer that has that fine-tuned gut, that fine-tuned yep. hunch. Yep. Uh, one example that I, I didn't talk about on that episode were instances where you would come into a burglary in, pro in progress. You know, like you would see something suspicious and you would catch the burglar in the process of robbing the house, yep. right? Uh, and the average, I think the statistics on the average of this occurring in an officer's career was maybe once or twice in their career. I think on general, it was about once. Like you so retire, that's pretty low. Your entire it? career, yeah. that's just the average. You you would have this happen once. But there was this officer they, they mentioned in the book, it happened to him at least once every year. Really? Yeah, he was just, he would get this feeling, he would go check out some area of town, and he would just stumble across a burglar. There, burglar. there was a story about that. Uh, let me just see if I included that in my notes. It was it was much later on. Um, I know it happened in, in Arizona, and it related to... No, I don't have it here. We might come... I'll just describe it. Essentially, there was a woman who was having strange um, dreams, and she had... I don't believe she'd shown any type of psychic abilities previously. This was completely random. This is what is strange about some of these events, is that people actually... Some people will have recurrent events where they're able to pick up on clues and they'll have dreams that provide information and they'll essentially act as an informant to the police quite regularly. Mm. Where and But the information will be kind of very small, but it would come through as this trickle. It'd be small, but there would be a lot of it. Whereas other people, they'll have like this one-off dream, but it will be spectacular. Like all this information will come flowing through and then that's it. Like they never have another experience again. Um, but there was this one particular woman that had this dream where um, she saw a robbery happening in progress. It was like a Circle K somewhere in Arizona. And as this robbery was happening, she was so terrified by in her dream state because um, she wasn't sure if people got injured. It kind of ends before that, but she gets the feeling. It's like this energy that comes from it. And she woke up the following morning and it was so profound and so at the forefront of her mind that she was just obsessing over it, you know, all throughout the day. And she went and she did, you know, her household, you know, chores and whatever else. And it just kept on coming back. Now she took a break in the afternoon to sit down and watch the soaps. And she's just watching, you know, Days of Our Lives or something similar. When all of a sudden the TV just starts like shimmering and the shimmer kind of comes down. It's like it drops down like a curtain and it's this representation of her dream. And it's on the TV in front of her. And she's not like in a dreamlike state. Mm. She's not, you know, having any type of, it's like you or I would watch a television set, but it's exactly what she saw in her dream. And she watches this. And this is just so shocking for her that she's just like, I've got to call the police. I've got to tell the police. So in the dream, she not only got the details of the location, she also got the description of this guy. And she said it was a one Hispanic male and uh, one Caucasian guy, but with this huge bushy mustache. Like it really stood out in this dream. So she calls the police. And the police at first thought she was somehow involved. They thought that yeah, she Yeah, this had... happens a lot. There's, yeah. And there's psychic detectives or psychics that assist detectives that get investigated and some have even been charged. Yes, until le until like some people have gone to jail until evidence comes yeah. forward later on that actually gets them out of it. Like yeah. it's it's really shocking. Um and that comes up in a case I'll mention in a moment. But um yeah, so sh she calls the police and the police think that she's involved because apparently there was some you know, information that something was going to occur. Well, often there's no conventional way they could know the information, obviously. Uh, obviously. Yeah. And so the, the Well, the only conventional way that you could know is that you're involved. Yeah, that you're involved, exactly. So um eventually what happens though is they deploy police to this um, particular Circle K and they um are out there until one o'clock in the morning when they see this guy wandering about who's acting suspiciously, like he's clearly suspicious, there's clearly something, and they go up and they they stop him. Uh, they find that he's armed and they find that he's got this massive mustache. And he was, they don't, I don't think they got him on actually committing the crime, but they got him on something else. But the fact that he was there, it was almost like because she'd had this dream and she'd persisted in telling the police about it, they were able to prevent this crime from taking place. 
I, that's getting more specific. <laughs> like, that's specific. useful information. Yeah, they're very specific. But look out for the guy with the conspicuous moustache. <clears throat> well, that's that, yeah, well, I mean, that's the funny thing about it as well, because it was like in the dream, it was kind of emphasized. Mm. So it was just weird how these little things can kind of play a role in creating these clues. But then let's go back to, you know, television psychics, right? Because this was all the rage in 1994. Let's do it, honey. Oh, yeah, we come Oh, she's dead, honey. So in March of 1994, you Is have- Is she in the book? No, she's not in the book, actually. <laughs> uh, and probably rightly so. So you have Dave Mandel, who was a psychic dreamer. That's what he called himself. But he regularly assisted police in fighting terrorist incidents. So, of course, you know, with the IRA and what was going on back then. Now, um, but what he would do, is not only would he have a dream and, and record it, the way that he would record it is that he would have the dream and have the premonition and he would wake up in the morning and he would sketch it. He would actually sketch it and draw it out. He would then What's take- What's his name again? His name is uh, Dave Mandel. So he would then take the sketch to a bank and stand in front of the bank with a clock in front of it and a date and have his photograph taken. Oh, so he could right, show just to record it. it. So to record it. Yeah. To, and to prove, because obviously it's a bank, so everyone knows that it's going to have the correct time. And you know, it also, it always proves that, yeah, like he's had this premonition. So it's not like he's saying after the fact, oh yeah, you know, I knew that was going to happen because I had this dream. He's got ways to validate it. So um, on London Tonight, he appears on this this show, which was like this, this I guess, um, tabloid television show. And he produces this sketch. So the previous evening he'd had a dream and he produces the sketch. And the sketch shows a shower of lights that look like fireworks. It's coming from a line of parked cars. And it seems that the lights are falling into a river or a runway, right? But no one's entirely sure what, what it is. Obviously, like all of this stuff, it's open to a lot of interpretation. Trying to find the sketch. He doesn't Google very well. No. Now, the very next day, IRA terrorist shelled the, run shelled the runway at London's Heathrow Airport. Now, the way that they did this, they launched mortar bombs from a line of parked cars, no less. So he, he was right. Ah, he was I did correct. find him. Did you find the image? The sketch? I'm trying, oh, there's a YouTube video of him. 240p, let's skip it. Oh, yeah, that's probably not going to be so good. So then let's go back to Chris Robinson, right? And so in June of 1996, it's two years later, he started having a series of very disturbing dreams that demonstrated an absolutely terrible atrocity like a horrible atrocity. And he was having dreams of concrete boots and tall buildings, like concrete boots. Like why would you have a dream of concrete boots and tall buildings? And he realized that, and there were dogs appearing, right? And he knows from his previous experience that dogs, ah, dogs are the IRA. So the fact that he was having dreams about tall buildings and the IRA dogs, he's like, there's something going to go on. There's going to be a bombing, you know, mm. somewhere. And somehow in the dream, he got the information that London was the target. The but there was this puzzling element. Shaking. Oh, yes. I was just going to play that in the background, in sorry, but this is the guy. The same dream recurred, this time in colour. Is that the, is that's that the, the one you're talking about, right? Liberty over here. No, that's... No, oh, so he predicted 9-11. That's 9-11! The these buildings literally crashing down on themselves. It actually woke me up. They were shaking so violently. Um, the only thing I could think of was an earthquake. Nine oh, I drew a plane. David sketched a third dream. But the important thing about this dream was there were two twin-engined aeroplanes, both flying in opposite directions and hitting buildings. Huh. When he heard the news that two planes had hit the Twin Towers, David was profoundly shocked. When I sort of realised that the Twin Towers had collapsed, uh, and actually saw it for the first time on the t on the television. That's when I started, you know, uh, the, the, the sort of feeling sh sh shuddering and. Uh... Jeez, it's a bit late now, mate. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know what? I mean, I know you're obviously just joking, but this is a problem with this kind of stuff. Is it because it's it's it's. After hindsight, again, hindsight, you can go, yep, yeah, it all makes sense. Yeah, but if you but if you time, got that specific dream and you'd had several hits in the past and you do this amazing crayon drawing of two towers getting hit by planes, wouldn't you go and look up you would, where probably. there's two towers in the world and maybe do more, like go to the press? Especially if you've had a past record of getting well, that's true hits. Yeah, you probably would but maybe he did. You know, maybe he did approach authorities and they probably dismissed him or, you know, who knows what's going on there. But, I mean, that's that's truly you know, incredible if he, uh, you know, was able to, to pick up on that. Um, but going back to Chris Robinson, where, you know, he's having these dreams about concrete boots, there was this puzzling element that came up where the letter M kept on showing. And mm. what I mean by that is he was dreaming about maps, mountains, the name McKinley kept on coming up in his dream. And he's like, oh, 
McKinley, is that a victim? Is that the name of like, that's an, is that an Irish name? Is that one of the members of the IRA? You know, is that the person who plants the bomb? What does this mean? And he says, a lot of the times that um, in the dream, whatever the element is, it will give you the postcode. And so he's like, oh, concrete boots. I saw a lot of concrete boots. CB, oh, CB is Cambridge. Like that's the postcode for Cambridge. So what's with the M? Like the M isn't a location. So on June the 10th, uh, he happens to have an associate by the name of uh, Jeanette and Jeanette calls him and she's like, look, uh, I know that you've been having dreams. Um, I don't want to bring myself onto the radar of the IRA. I really don't want them to blow up my house or my car, uh, but I've seen the attack and it's going to happen. And she validates without knowing what his dream is. She validates what he had dreamt about. Oh, interesting. So the two of them are having the same, and they kind of, you know, then talk about what they had mm. had done. And they realize that absolutely the IRA was planning an attack on London. Mm. That was going to happen. So they contact the authorities uh, because the authorities had worked with Robinson before. They knew that he was onto something. But guess what? This is like a, a paradox because it's almost like the intervention of attempting to stop an event from taking place causes the event to take place, right? Because he says How? that- so they've had this, they've both had this dream. They approach the authorities. The authorities step up policing. Now, Jeanette had dreamt that the attack was in Piccadilly. She was like, it's in Piccadilly. That's, yeah. that's definitely where it's going to happen. But because the authorities had stepped up, um, uh, you know, their presence in that area, on the very last day, apparently the well, offenders- were forced to change their plans. They I changed guess. their plans. They changed their plans. So a few days later, a bomb was planted in a car outside a shopping center in Manchester, right? That's the M that kept on coming up. Oh, wow. So he'd already had the dream where M was there and it was quite prominent, but he'd missed it because M is the postcode for Manchester. And so if he hadn't have gone to the authorities, then they would have gone through with the original plans, which, which meant been in that London. the M shouldn't have been in his dream. That's so right. So it's a paradox. Well, that, that's right, right? So the other factor that comes up is that this was very effective. The IRA, um, I guess... I shouldn't use the word civil because that's not right. But part of their, their technique was that they um, would always call authorities before they set off a bomb. So they would- To minimize casualties. To minimize casualties, but to create obviously fear and anxiety. So they would tell people right before it happened, you know, where it was. Now, in this particular event, they were able to evacuate, uh, but sadly one person was killed in this uh, you know, attack. But going back to Jeanette saying it was in Piccadilly, it just so happens that where this car exploded- it backed onto um, a, a lane called Piccadilly Gardens. Hmm. So it's like they got the information, yeah. but it wasn't accurate. Like it wasn't, hmm. it was, well, sorry, what's the difference between accuracy and precision? It's one of those, right? Yeah, so it wasn't, having the dream isn't enough. Having the psychic inf information isn't enough. You need to be able to refine it yep. and really and drill down message. into the details. And Yeah. Which is extremely... Get the accuracy that's, that's missing from a dream, obviously. Yeah. It's just a dream. And, and this event, by the way, it was the largest peacetime bomb in the UK history. Yeah. Again, so. this is why you need the pool, you need the ladies, you need the tubes, you need Tom Cruise. <laughs> well, maybe. Yeah, maybe. So um, what else have we got here? So, Oh, I'm sorry. So that case, right, from, from Circle K that was next to my, in my list here, that was Dorothy Nickerson, and that happened in 1982. Mm -hmm. um, but let's skip forward now to... Uh, oh, this is fascinating. This is Michael Benteen. So Michael Benteen is an author, uh, and it just so happens that, and we hear this about a lot of authors, right, that when you go into that writing space and the creativity starts coming through, it's almost a meditative space in mm -hmm. some way. And it just so happens that Michael was uh, in Spain, he was relaxed, it was October 1980, and he is, is writing, but all of a sudden he has this vision appear, this scene that appears before him. And it's... Uh, a terrible event that takes place where a group of Americans, and he wasn't aware of this, but a group of Americans had been kidnapped by terrorists in Iran, and then um, the, Jimmy Carter was preparing to mount some type of Delta strike to, to go and rescue them, and he saw it all go wrong. He saw helicopters, concrete buildings, uh, but the most important thing that he saw out of this was two buses running down gates, like these two single-decker buses running down, and it was just so prominent. And it was so upsetting to him because he hadn't really had an experience like this before that it just so happened that he had friends in the House of Commons. And somehow the news came through that this event was taking place. So he contacted his friends in the House of Commons and said, look, look, what I just told you, like all the story, what I told you, you, you have to stop this. You can't mm -hmm. let it happen. He receives a, a letter or a telegram from an MP, um, you know, a couple of weeks later saying, oh, thank you very much for your information. Uh, you were pretty good, but uh, you got the buses wrong, right? Kind of indicating, it says, you know, that they were indicating that, yeah, like he was 
obviously he'd picked up on something, um, but he'd gotten it wrong. But it just so happens, and it's funny how these things kind of work out, that he had a contact at the CIA. I mean, how do people just happen to have contacts at the CIA? But he did. And this contact at the CIA... Well, like, he was in the war. He was in the RAF. Well, there you go. So maybe that's why. Based but, on his, And he was a comedian. The guy was just best known for being a comedian. But yeah. it looks like, yeah, he had this um, previous career in military. Yeah. So he's talking to his friend or his contact in the CIA. And the, the guy, like he's telling him about the vision that he had, you know, how like it could have been stopped. And the guy from the CIA is like, oh, no, you were right about the buses. He's like, he's like, what do you mean? He's like, this was never officially publicized. Oh. But part of the plan was, is that once we had done the initial strike, we were going to bring in two buses and run down the gates and evacuate everyone on the buses. But we had to stop that because things had gone haywire beforehand. So he had seen the plan and he described in this vision that he had, mm. what he actually saw was not just the events taking place. He saw the plan unfolding. So somehow he didn't necessarily pick up on the event. He picked up on the intentions of the rescuers. Strange, like really, really strange for this kind of stuff. He's got happen. a couple of ancient books for you to dive into. Well, there you go. I, I will be doing that. I will have to find that book and uh, and pick that one up. So then we move into missing persons cases because they act uh, are quite prominent in this kind of stuff. And this is where psychometry really does play a big role. Um, you've got Dorothy Allison. Now, she apparently had inherited her mother's gift of dreaming. And um, she would just help out family and friends sharing insight and just doing little things. And it wasn't until she was in her mid-40s mm. When she actually came into the world of psychic detection, where she actually started being uh, not necessarily employed, but helping out policing agencies. So December the 3rd, 1967, she has this dream. And this is, is truly awful, right? Um, but essentially, she has this dream where she sees this little boy stuck inside a pipe in a park in New Jersey. Like it's this pipe and he's, he's freezing and it's quite, you know, horrible. And this image remained in her mind for weeks and weeks and weeks and distressed her. Um, because it was so realistic, like all of these incidents, they're always very realistic. So on January the 3rd, she approached a, a police chief friend by the name of Francis Buell, and she starts you know, describing this vision that she had, and he's shocked. He's like, the person you're describing, well, the description matches that of a missing boy. His name's Michael uh, Kersix, and he vanished while playing in a park weeks before. Now, the problem with this is that she couldn't specify a location. Mm. She could not specify the location. She had all this energy and, and emotion and mm. sadness and everything else associated with it and all the, the effects of the family. And this is the funny thing as well. No surrounding area no, descriptions. She, just, she or... knew it was a pipe in New Jersey. Okay. That, that's all she that's had really from it. Really narrow it down. And it, it's funny because there's a number of psychic uh, investigators or you know, psychics that are involved in this stuff that I was reading about later on that what they actually do is they deliberately isolate themselves or refuse to work with the families of victims or of, of missing persons because their emotions actually overwhelm their psychic abilities. Right. And they find that they'll be influenced by the person and they'll get incorrect information or they'll just it just doesn't work for them. Um, sadly, on February the 7th, uh, it was unusually warm and uh, this boy, unfortunately, his body um, melted in the pipe and came out of the pipe and they found him. He Yeah, he'd gone to play... He was just doing what kids do. He climbed into the pipe and sadly had gotten stuck and had frozen to death. Um, but fortunately, all these stories are just not always negative. Yeah, it, it's a terrible thing to take place. I see you put the image up here, Ben. Um, fortunately, there are many, many positive cases that come about. And this is where psychometry comes into play, where we head now to the case of Tommy Kennedy. So this occurred in New York County in August of 1982. Uh, it was a Sunday morning picnic that was being conducted by uh, Tommy Kennedy's family on Empire Lake. Uh, now, everything was fine, except for whatever reason, Tommy had just wandered off. Like he just wandered off and his mother became frantic because he'd taken his shoes off and then just disappeared. Now, because his shoes were off, she's like, surely he couldn't get too far away. Mm. But he was gone. And 20 officers. This were, is uh, the old spirited away Kami Nakushi. Yeah, I, I got that kind of, and that, that while that's not mentioned in this book, I get that feeling about it because we find How that, far away is he found? I'll let you tell the story. Yeah, well, okay. Well, I'll let you know. Meters, right? But we'll come oh, back to it. okay. Meters. Um, but not in the way that you think. So there's 20, it's got missing four and one elements to it. Mm. Because these um, 20 officers come down. Then, of course, other people in the area see the commotion that's going on. So they get other people in and there's search and rescuers and volunteers and there's divers that show up because obviously they're near a lake. And if they can't find the boy anywhere near them, where else is he probably yeah. gone? He's probably gone into the lake. And sadly- the divers out. Sadly, they bring up his T-shirt 
like this, his t-shirt, a diver found his t-shirt, but it just so happens that the, the diver was a friend of a local psychic by the name of Phil Jordan. Um, no, it was a fireman who was involved, sorry. So the fireman Richard Clark was friends with uh, psychic Phil Jordan. He took the t-shirt and gives it to, to Phil Jordan and says, look, can you pull anything out of this? And he's like, absolutely, I can. And the way that it's described is really intriguing. Apparently, he sits there and goes into this meditative state and he starts using his fingers. And he's like feeling all around the shirt. And he's like, as he's feeling the shirt, it's like pictures, like data are flowing through his fingers from the shirt the up hell? into his mind, like up through his arm. Yeah, this is what the Polish guy described. Yeah. When he would touch objects that were owned by the missing person, he would get these images, start flashing movies. He described them as movies yep. in his mind. Yep. That's exactly what's happening in this case. Like he's, he's picking up this information and he can see these scenes. He sees an overturned boat. He sees, fortunately, he's like, the boy's okay. He's asleep under a tree. Now, sadly, the police chief, Ray Ayres, uh, was not convinced. He's just like, oh, come on. Like, we've already searched this area. We've already been through this. There's no way. These... He's like, no, 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 no. You have to go and look. You have to go and look. And he refuses. So uh, Jordan actually goes down there and sees the mother. Like, this is one of those cases where he actually goes and seeks out the family members. And he sees the mother. He says, give me the boy's shoes. So he gets hold of the shoes, right? And he's hanging onto the shoes. And he almost, well, he does. He goes into a trance and holding the shoes, like almost like a dousing rod, he's like, picking up on the energy and he's spinning around trying to sense and trying to feel the energy from these shoes, right? But honing in on the direction to go. And he does. And he latches on to like this path and just starts completely on autopilot straight through the forest. He heads through the forest and it's, you know, like meters away, you know, maybe, you know, a dozen meters or so. Um, they find the boy like right next to this little tree underneath an overturned boat. He just wandered off and he gotten lost. And he was just because he's a little kid he was disoriented. He didn't know where to go. So he just laid down. And it was really- Was he under the boat? I think he was like next to the boat. And he was really lucky though, because he was suffering from exposure. And had it been much longer, he would have probably perished. Wow. But it's, isn't it amazing? Uh, that area though had been searched. So we Yeah, the reason I mentioned Kamikakushi is it, it means spirited away. That's where the, the movie's from, is that folklore in Japan. But the idea is that it translates to something like taken by the spirits or That's take, right. taken well, Kami, by the yeah. gods. And- in a lot of those old folklore stories, and we've covered a bunch of them over the years, but it would often be a small child around that age yep. who would just suddenly vanish. Like the the mother would turn around and then that the, that'd be gone. And in the blink of an eye, there were stories where it was like missing four one one. Like they'd find them up a mountain somewhere. It was impossible for them to reach. But there are also many stories where they'd be missing for you know a day. Mm -hmm. uh, but then they would turn up like on the roof of the house. That's right. Yeah. No idea how or they the could peak have, of a mountain. Yeah, how they could have gotten there. Yeah. You know, places that have been obviously searched over and over again. Well, obviously, I mean, th this book is quite big, but it's got like lots and lots of cases that have been very much, you know, summarized and, and shrunken down. So there was a factor there. I was like, well, hang on. You know, I, I get it that he took his shoes off, which, you know, happens, but there's this this missing form on one element of like he took his shirt off, but then his shirt was yeah. found in the water, but he yeah. was found in the opposite direction. It's weird. It's weird, isn't it? It's, like, you know, it's, got, it's not the full story that no. he just wandered the, over and the, laid down. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's like a, a crossover between and, Ami and Kakushi. How and would he not hear the searchers calling his name right. if he's only, you know, 20 meters away? He's right there. Yeah, it just, it just doesn't make sense. So then we come to... Um, where you know, psychometry in some way can be a blessing, but can also be a curse. And this is the story of Catherine Hilton. Um, and it's only brief, this one, but as a child, her nickname was, was Lucky. And the reason for this is because she hated wearing shoes. And the reason why she hated wearing shoes is because when she was, I guess it comes down to this whole like being grounded silliness that you know, pops. Have you seen all the grounded people on TikTok? How they, I'll see if I can. You got to connect with the earth. Yeah, there's like a to discharge a, your whatever. Yeah, I think is it Itozi or whatever. He used to like he reports on people that like they get kicked out of restaurants because they go in barefoot, so they cut the soles off their oh shoes God, and then just extreme. like put fake shoes on the top. There, there's something to that research that, in terms of the electrical nature of the human body, you do need to make contact with the yeah. earth. But from what I've read in the original idea that not in New York walking through the well, shit subway. The purveyors of it said you just you didn't need to do it once a day. Like all you can do is take your shoes off, you go outside for five seconds, done. Right. You're grounded. Yeah. Like it just you're making that electrical connection. Yeah. And then you can get on with the rest of your day. You don't need to just do it all day. Yeah. Not walking through Walmart in the middle of a New York winter. So um coming down to, you know, the experiences though of of Catherine she would take her shoes off because she could feel everything in the ground. 
And oh. so she could like pick up and sense things. So there's this one particular time where she was walking home through this uh, deep trench and it was like grass on either side. And as she's walking along this, this ditch, she gets this sudden flash of vivid green, like extremely vivid green. And she looks down. She hadn't touched anything, but she was walking right near it. She looks down. It's a $10 note, which to a kid is just like, <laughs> so she picked up on the green of the, the note, right? So years later in the winter of 1965, um, a storm, she had this, it's only a silly thing, but it shows you how these, these psychic detectives kind of work. A storm had blown a fence down and she got home and her dog was gone. So for whatever reason, she used this ability to ground herself and wandered about the streets following her dog's psychic trail. And she got this, when she walked onto the trail, she'd suddenly get this flash of a car yard and she got this flash of a car yard and her dog wandering around. So she follows this trail. So obviously she's grounded to. the psychometry doesn't work unless she's making skin contact with yeah. the ground. Yeah. I, I just Googled uh, Kathy Hilton's psychic feet and I got uh, WikiFeet, the celebrity feet website. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll be looking at that as you're describing your content. Uh, what's the term? Um, henhito. It is a Japanese term. Anatoa being... henhito. Whoa! <laughs> Look at that one. <laughs> Look at those heels. <laughs> Go on. Sorry, continue. <laughs> oh, God. What's the Marvel woman? What's the woman that did uh, Captain Marvel? Oh, no. <laughs> I'm sure that's not on here. Gross. <laughs> Google that. Yeah, Google that. So not now, not on, not on our Fung show. That's FungalFeet.com. No, no, for you people listening, you, you do Google that. So then I come up to the uh, the flux capacitor phenomenon, right? And this is just a brief one as well, but I'll just mention it. Uh, this relates to uh, Peter Herkos. So Peter Herkos was this well-known psychic um, that, you know, kind of was you, not Yuri Geller, but Yuri mm. Geller in a way esque that he could, you know, show off these incredible abilities. And um, like he had this incredible experience where he was in a hospital and uh, he started being concerned that I, th I don't know if he'd touched the guy next to him or something, but he got this sensation and feeling that there was something really wrong with this guy, that this guy was in danger. And the hospital authorities just thought that he was, um, you know, hallucinating, right? But the reason why he was in hospital, and we'll come back to the guy in a moment, the reason why he was in the hospital is because he'd fallen off a ladder while um, painting barracks, right? He was in the military and he'd fallen off the ladder. He acquired this psychomic, uh, psy psychometry ability mm. By having a head injury, right? Yeah, there's a few of these. You hear these all the time. Well, it's it's funny that you know, earlier in the book it should mention brain structure, mm. and you have people having head injuries clearly altering their brain structure, even in a subtle way, um, that opens up these abilities. Mm. So it just turns out that yeah, they're like, oh, the guy's hallucinating. It's nothing. The guy turned out to be a British spy and was shot by the Nazis oh, wow. later on. So he was picking up on on something from. This Sorry, ability. I'm just distracted by all these feet. <laughs> Yuck! <laughs> Some good ones on here. <laughs> Oh, okay. So let's let's have a look at douses. Let's bring up, um, oh, yes, the story of Paul Smith. So Paul Smith is a great example of feeling energy. Uh, you know, and, and more so, so this than, is another psychometrist. I no, it's not psychometry. It's dousing, mm -hmm. but using a dousing rod to pick. It's always funny because you've got the story of the woman, you know, Catherine, who is putting her feet on the ground. Um, but she's picking up on those those lines and those pathways. Dowsers, in a funny way, do the same thing. Like they, but they're using an instrument. So it's almost like you 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 focus the instrument to to function. But they all do the same thing. Well, you might presume that a dowser needs to be in the general area of where the missing person might be. But often the dowsers just use maps. Oh, they use maps. That happens. Oh, and that so it's dowsing pendulums. That's yeah. a really big one that comes up. You know, um, there was one where I think it was even in fact Yuri Geller. I believe there was a Japanese um, conglomerate or a Japanese businessman connected to a large Japanese conglomerate who in 1984. Uh, hired Yuri Geller mm. to find gold in Brazil. And the way that he did it is he got like it's a map, a map, a map yeah. of Brazil and Yuri Geller would just hold his hand over a map and Yuri Geller said that he could feel like his hand would suddenly go like a magnet, like it would stick to it. And so he would do it all, all over and he would just touch the, um, the, the map and he was able to find gold. And this Japanese... Uh, group of businessmen made a fortune. Have you seen his latest posts on X, old Yuri? No. He's saying that the Large Hadron Collider is going to, uh, if not, if it hasn't already, it's going to open a portal into another dimension. Uh, yeah, and it <laughs> opened allow, here in Australia. Allow the entities through. Yeah, it's probably already opened. It's here in Australia. A big long rant from Yuri on the, the portals and the aliens and the ultra-terrestrials. 
you know, I don't necessarily believe the whole, oh yeah, like a bunch of countries get together and just build this large, you know, thing underground spending billions and billions of dollars all in the name of smashing particles. It's a weapon. It's a West. It's the whole thing. It's a freaking <laughs> weapon. Think about it. Who spends that amount of money apart uh, from the, the military EU. industrial complex? Yes. The EU. Yeah. Well, they do waste a lot of money. They yeah. are commies, so that's a good point. So coming back to uh, the the Paul Smith story, right? So um, apparently Paul Smith, he describes this really fascinating case in 1985 where he would use dousing, like just a dousing rod, to find water and oil on his property, on uh, other properties. It would kind of you know lend out his services. But it just so happened that this uh, circular, like a local newspaper rag, came through one day. And the newspaper rag had this article in it. And it was from, I've got it here. It was from the Seven Continent Dousers Society. And they were holding a competition where people would um, would get 20 minutes and they would go to this five and a half or so acres of land. They'd be given 20 minutes to do their dousing to find this uh, cylinder. Contained within the cylinder was a certificate which was redeemable for an $800 <laughs> gold cool. coin, right? <laughs> That's cool. Now, he claims that the moment that he picked up this circular, it was like, zzz, like electric. Oh. And he was just like, ah, ah, like just shocked by this thing. So it's like geocaching, but for dousers. But for dousers. So he knew, he's like this feeling that he got and the warmth heading up his arm and this electrical feeling is like, I've got to go. Mm. And so he does, right? So he goes to this. And what's incredible is that they had set a whole bunch of uh, fake clues. So they'd kind of try to distract people. And there's, look, no way. I think the chance it said in you finding something like this was one in a billion or whatever. So you needed real uh, you read dousing need real psychic abilities, abilities Absolutely. to track it down. And he did. He managed to find this one particular tree. Beneath the tree was like this little metal box that was down in underneath the drain. He pulled up, opened the drain. He pulled up the box. He reached in and he pulls out the cylinder and is awarded this $800 gold coin. Is that, uh, did you just describe the end of Shawshank Redemption? <laughs> I think that's like no, the, no, the end no, of the movie. No. That's, it's actually pretty close, except for the gold coin. Um, but no, so when he pulled this coin out, you know, it was, um, I mean, obviously gold is worth less than it is now, but people said, look, do you want to sell it? He's like, no, this is, this is proof of, for me, mm. of what I was capable of doing with his dousing. Um, but then dousing, like dousing is an old thing. You've got 1662, you've got uh, the French Jacques Aymar, and uh, he would talk about, about dousing, and he would claim that he would feel heat, um, but he was one of the earliest psychic detective dousers in the sense that one day he was dousing for something, and he felt like this immediate pull and this kind of energy coming from it, and he, he pulled down, he like started digging, and he dug up a head, like he dug up oh, some gross. head, right? And so when he dug out the woman's head, <laughs> apparently the other people like townsfolk came about and they were like, oh, oh, oh and they, were, they knew who it was. Like they recognized it. And it's like, let's go and see the husband. So he takes a dousing rod and the dousing rod is just like immediately when he gets into the husband, it's just like, whoa, 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 like indicating it's him. The guy flipped out and ran, obviously indicating his guilt. Um, and so immediately this guy was taken by authorities to be... Um, assisting in in crimes and, and research. And so they said to him, look, can you help us find the killer of this uh, wine merchant? And he's like, yeah, okay, yep, I can do that. Yeah, I remember reading about this guy. We covered him on the show years yeah, ago. Yeah, years ago. Yeah, some so great stories. If you recall, and I'll just make it very much a nutshell, but if you recall, um, the guy was so accurate that it turns out it wasn't a singular killer. Mm. It was three people that had been killed, right. had been murderers. He followed all the way down a river. Uh, what he managed to do is he pointed at each of these little houses or these little pub, you know, pubs as he went along, and he was able to identify where these people had been. Um, and he found out that yeah, it was these three guys. These and guess what? The only, pardon me, the only reason why he stopped is because he got to the French border. They had fled, and he was later on able to validate this. Yeah, I mean, crime fighting through dousing. Is that him? I don't know if that's that's him. Thomas Pennant. No, that's not that's not him. Um, my favorite one though, my favorite story in all of this, and we'll keep it towards the end. This is what I I, I like as um <laughs> so, 1956. Uh it's um uh, Myrna Aiken. This is a South African case. Uh there was a psychic by the name of Nelson Palmer. Uh apparently uh Myrna had had gone. She was it was missing, no one knew, you know, where she was. So um he goes, this is the psychic, Nelson Palmer, he goes to the family. And uh, the family give him a pair of underwear of her panties. Not nice. does he put them on? <laughs> he does. <laughs> I, for whatever reason, I get the impression that he does like hold them like right up. But basically, he he holds onto them, and straight away he's like, "She's dead, honey." <laughs> straight away. Nice. This is why I called it dead panties. 
Because, yeah, he knew. And so he's like, oh, my God. Like, and not only did he get this, he got the information from the panties that she was dead. She was lying in water. This all came through from this. Even though that wasn't panties she was wearing. It just happened to be a, you know, a pair. That you just need house. something that's connected. Something to connected. Um, what was astonishing is that he also got this uh, these details and radios like popped up in his head. Was she murdered? She, accident? She was murdered. She, they go to this house, right? It wasn't an accident. She was murdered, but she was murdered by a radio repairman who had been in the house and taken a liking to her three days pre- previously. Mm-hmm. So it's like this stuff, like this, you, look, unless the guy was involved, but these cases show that there's just, there's no way they could have been involved. There's no way. that. They so why was that your favorite case? Just because it had panties? Just in because it. it was the dead, she's, she's, she's dead, dead honey. That was straight away. I'm just like, that's it. <laughs> that's all I, like, that's what he does. Like he literally is like, <laughs> and not only that, it's exactly the same thing as that particular case because she's lying in water. And with Sylvia Brown, she's like, she's in water, honey. <laughs> it's exactly the same thing. <laughs> So um, then we have the story of Nella Jones, and this is well, it's 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 very light. So I'll, this is why I'll mention this case. Um, Nella, February nineteen seventy four. Um, she's just you know running around doing things around her house. She's watching television while ironing, and while she's ironing, these words just leap from the TV and come into her mind. Hmm. And it's this scene of a local TV report saying that, uh, or a news report that a painting, a very famous painting worth two million pounds, had been stolen. And immediately she's just like, she's like, that's not it. That's not the right place. Like they're showing this scene, but she's got this overlay. She's like, that's not the right place. So she calls the authorities. She calls the police. She says, look. Sorry, it keeps uh, unmuting the video every time I bring it up on the screen. Oh, here we go. This is, yeah, a, just a little video about Nella Jones. Keep telling your story. So she um, she sees this and she's like, no, this isn't right. So she calls the the authorities. And when she calls the authorities, she provided all this really intriguing like information, like all these details. And the police are like, Clearly you're involved, but clearly you know Yeah, about. right. Now, she goes out to the site, uh, and it just so happens that she knew uh, basically they had dumped the frame because the frame was so heavy, and that they had dumped... Oh, she goes into the water, and she runs into the water, and she um, basically, because she drew a map without thinking, she goes into this trance-like state, and in the map... Uh, it reveals that in the lake, uh, the alarm, the metal alarm, which had been used on the, the painting, had been tossed into the lake. And she was able oh, to validate wow. this. Right? And, and so they're like, you must be involved. Turns out she's not involved, right? Obviously, but she had information that no one else could have known. But what they do realize is that five days later, um, it was found in a cemetery. And she had revealed that it was going to be in a cemetery. She had this information. But where? It had just, this woman, just spontaneously in her house, gets this, these in, this information coming through. Why is she molestering this young child? I don't know. That is a very good question. She looks very happy with herself, though. Um, so then we go to Lancaster, California. Uh, and this relates to... Uh, oh, actually, yeah, this was, this was really great. Look, this is how she gets the, um, the energy. This is how she gets the information. So in the video here, she's got her hands on this woman's head. And she was doing this with a, a, a young child earlier. She told this- me it was perfectly true and sincere on her part. She's Over the like, next 20 years, Nella would come to the police with apparent information on a number of cases. So she's manhandling their heads. <laughs> to, but what's like, it's to a form of the, psychometry, Yeah, isn't to it? get some yeah, kind of info. Look, I genuinely believe that these people have abilities because it's just being demonstrated over and over again. And yes, there's plenty of charlatans out there, but there's also, I think, a number of people that are obviously being quite genuine. And because in many of these cases, well, they don't seek remuneration or anything like that. They don't want money for it. They're just happy to help. And yeah, people, there are a lot of people out there that seek attention, but I don't think these cases are that. I think people are actually having genuine experiences. Um, But Audrey LeBeau, in 1910, she was 10 years old. She was staying in Oxfordshire with her family. And she awakens one night to find this disheveled man digging in the garden wall, like this is wall and uh, retaining wall of some kind. And she's freaked out because it's just, he looks out of place. It doesn't Mm. seem right. She wakes up in the morning. She tells her family, her family, like, you're absurd. You're being absolutely absurd. There was no man out there. That's just not possible. It happens again the following night. And it really distresses her. It really freaks her out. So in the morning, her mother sees how distressed that she is. And she's like, okay, uh, let's go out and have a look at the wall. They go out to the wall. And of course, there's nothing there. Nothing. She's like, see, you just had a bad dream. You know, sometimes bad dreams can seem very real, but it's not. But the grandmother was like, hang on a second. Like, where exactly was this man? And she points and they point to a part of the wall. So they, they pull out a trowel and start digging. And they dig into the wall and when they, they hit something, right? 
they find, and I where it's um, some old bones. No, it's a pot of gold coins from 1665. Oh my gosh! It was from the time of the plague, and what was likely it was someone who was probably affected by the plague that was trying to hide their wealth. Right. And was storing it in the wall. And nearly 400 years later, he's still trying to get his gold. Yeah, it was I mean, <laughs> either trying to put it in or get it, who knows. But we hear, like, we talk about treasure guardians and that kind of stuff. Like, it was like she was trying, like the the entity, she must have been picking up on the uh, desperation of the entity mm. that, as you say, hundreds of years later, it starts coming through. Um, so then let's go over to towards the end here. And I want to end up. Yeah, story. give us your give us your icing on the cake. Give us your uh, well, coup de gras. Okay, so the coup de gras here is the story of Dixie uh, Yetterin, and Dixie Yetterin is an- another one of these you know psychical researchers and investigators that initially was believed quite skeptically um, by the police to be involved in a horrible, terrible crime. Right, so Dixie has this dream, and apparently Dixie had a lifetime of kind of like what you were describing in that earlier episode, Ben, of being out of body and witnessing events taking place. Mm. And she does. She kind of has this out of body experience where she sees um, a young girl being being led away into like some horrible circumstance of a circle of, of 20 men or women, um, you know, eyes wide shut kind of stuff where she's brutally bashed and, and, and raped and murdered and all this horrible stuff that happens. And then whatever body like form, like she's in the form of, clearly another victim. This other victim is brought forward and she's attacked and raped. And it's all very visceral. In many of these cases, people that that work in these fields sometimes have to retire because it's so emotionally overwhelming. Not just simply, right? Not from how you or I or any normal person would be emotionally overwhelmed from seeing something like that. They're also psychically overwhelmed. They're psychically traumatized because it's like they've actually it's not like just hearing a story. It's they have lived that story. They yeah, have lived the, that experience. In the cases we covered on the PLOS episode, there were instances where the police were working with psychics who would embody the victim. That's right. And they would essentially become the victim and relive the crime. So Absolutely. they were suffering horrific murders. Yep. And to them, it was all very uh, visceral and in real. In the now and then, like in the the present. Um. So the, the second form that she's in uh, she's not initially murdered, like she's raped, which is horrible, um, but she manages to to get away. I'm not exactly sure how, how she gets away, but she manages to to get away. And uh, what she realizes, though, is she, she follows this scene of kind of she flies up and then she flies back down and she's in the body of this girl. And this girl has escaped from something, some mm. ritual practice, which is going on. It's, it's quite terrible. And she's running through this, um, like it's like a state highway or something, but it's up in the hills and she can't make out exactly where it is or what's occurring, but she can feel the emotion of it. And these cars, like she's trying to wave down cars and no cars are stopping, but then all of a sudden this blue station wagon stops and out jumps her boyfriend. And her boyfriend, um, you know, it's kind of like Get Out, you know, that movie where it's like, um, it's not her boyfriend. This boyfriend has basically falsely taken her in as a girlfriend but he's part of this ritual group that brings young women to be murdered and to be ritually sacrificed or whatever happens to them far out and dixie witnesses all of this right but what dixie also witnesses is that at one event this poor woman who is fleeing who's so terrified she takes off a shoe and throws the shoe right i don't know why she does this but she does it um but she climbed but she's pulled into the car by the boyfriend and these other people and she's taken away and she's murdered Right? And again, like many of these cases, because it's so vivid, she contacts the authorities and, you know, she contacts the authorities and they are, they are interested um, because she's able to provide information. And I think she does provide information as to where one of the bodies is, but not the second one, although she, she seems to know, but she can't exactly get it right. She's in the area. But the police are like immediately, the only way you could know that information is because you've probably been involved. Now, they don't tell her that, right? But they're, they're convinced. She's a suspect now. Right. The other detail that comes up is that um, because she describes the shoe, that was not information that was put out by the police. So the fact that she was able to describe the shoe was thrown, they're like, that's the that's why they think sh- that she's involved. But it becomes very apparent later on that, no, 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 she's not involved. Like that's cleared up quite rapidly that she's not involved. Um, but then, right, so she um, well, somehow makes a connection to this group, this psychic group. She doesn't know how, but she feels the energy of this murder of this boyfriend. She can feel it. And it's almost like she's left herself vulnerable. And she says this, someone starts stalking them. Starts this car, starts showing up. This car shows up at the front of her house. The car is a blue station wagon. 
Uh, she's convinced that it's it's them. Someone tries to kidnap her daughter. They know where she's at school. There's a note that's a very threatening note, which is left in her mailbox. Um, it's all terrible, right? Mm. So the police, knowing that, look, she's definitely onto something, but this, what appears to be an occult group, it's not said to be an occult group, but that's the inference that I make from this. This occult group knows that she, they're, that she's onto them. And because the, the media, right, the media has gotten involved with this, they publish her name. Like they published Dixie's name. So this is how the group had come and started harassing her, right? So the police go, well, we've gone too far. Like we need to stop this. So they get on the radio and they do this radio report, essentially defaming Dixie, saying how, look, oh, she provided all this information and she was so totally useless. And she wasn't, but they did that on purpose to put the the offenders off the track, right? Off the scent. Oh, interesting. Some stupid woman rings up the radio station and berates the police and provides information that basically proves that Dixie is the real deal. Like, defends her. Like, they're defending well, her. Well, how is the woman supposed to know? Well, she wasn't, but it, it stuffs everything up, right? And it creates this, this horrible circumstance for Dixie where she's completely under threat now. Um, eventually, it all dies down because they do discover the bodies. Uh, I don't think it's ever comes to any significant conclusion. conclusion. Is there arrests? Convictions? No, what they find out is that um, police found... Where is it here? So they found the bodies. Uh, apparently, 30 young girls... In the California region, uh, they believe had been killed by this My group. Gosh, they only found the a number of them. I think it was like nine of them, but it was up to thirty that had been killed by this That's group. It's shocking. It's horrible. This hor- and I, I think there's something occult. And look, it's California, Hollywood. You know, what's what's going on there? So look, there's definitely something. She had a long life. She only passed away last year. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Yeah, there's definitely something to this stuff. Great story to end the segment on. Yes, yes. Aaron? Make sure you check out Psychic Detectives using the power of the mind to solve true crimes. Um, And yeah, yeah, really, really great stuff. Jenny Randall's classics. And Peter Ho, you can't ignore him. Yeah, what did he do? (laughs) It's all Jenny Randall's, let's face it. (laughs) Yeah, that's a wrap for this free edition of MU, but... Fake pyramids coming up. Pyramids are fake and potentially gay. How are they? Okay, I'll let you reveal it. (laughs) It's coming up in plus. Mysteriousuniverse.org forward slash plus. Sign up today. We're going to be going into the incredible, what's it called again? The Natron Theory. I was showing this on the last plus show, going through this website from, uh, what's his name again? Marcel Foti. He explains how a lot of ancient monuments, well, how he believes they've actually been created. And it's through this very... Uh, interesting ancient technology that we perhaps have only just started to rediscover. And what Marcel is doing is he's trying to really get to the bottom of how some of these ancient monuments were constructed. And he's been doing his own experiments. Remember on the last show, I showed you there was an Xbox controller. Yeah, that's made out of stone. Uh, So Unless it's just carved soap or something. We're going to be going into, well, no, it's, it's real stone, uh, or, oh, is it? or is it? Stone. Or is it? Yeah. This goes into the world of geopolymers. This is uh, getting into the world of material sciences and how I mentioned this on the last show how you can have someone specialized in a field like Egyptology and archaeology, but they have no idea. They have no idea about the breakthroughs in a completely different field like material science. So when you get uh, someone who comes along who has a bit of a general understanding of both or is a specialist in one but not the other, sometimes you get this crossover and incredible new discoveries are made. So are they plastics? Is that what it is? Well, what Marcel is arguing is that if his theory proves to be correct, and he's not 100% sure yet, the experimentation is still going. But if it is correct, all the history books need to be rewritten on how ancient monuments were constructed across the world. We're not just talking about Egypt. We're talking about Stonehenge, Turkey, China, all over. So you mean going back as far as something like Gobekli Tepe, what, 12,600 years? Yes, so talking lost technologies. And the way we think about uh, ancient monuments being constructed, you know, ropes and pulleys, giant reeds, giant blocks being carved out of quarries, that might all be wrong. So that's coming up in plus. Head to mysteriousuniverse.org forward slash plus. Sign up today get, to get access. We do extensions on these shows every single Friday. Usually gets you uh, more than double the content if you sign up for our 
our Plus membership because you get an exclusive show every single Tuesday as well. You also get a higher quality MP3 version of the show for the audio, a totally ad-free version of our shows. And of course, uh, if you sign up for MU Max, you get access to our entire back catalogue going back 16, 17 years now worth of shows. And of course, all our videos uh, are available on the website for Plus members as well. You can log in and watch uh, both the Friday shows and the Tuesday shows on the website. Sign up today, mysteriousuniverse.org forward slash plus. That's a wrap for this free edition of MU. Thanks for listening. If you're on Plus, stick around for the great stuff after the break. For everyone else, we'll catch you next week. (laughs) 